Hello and, and welcome to this interview series ahead of Cloud and Cybersecurity Expo on the 6th and 7th of March at Excel London. I'm Stuart Crowley, editor of Techarati. Today, my guest is Steve Furnell, the Professor of Cybersecurity at the University of Nottingham. Steve will appear at Cloud and Cybersecurity Expo in March, but today we're going to talk about three years of his life that have shaped his life and career. So welcome to this interview series, Steve. Thank you very much. So Steve, let's kick off. What have you chosen as your first significant year? I believe I chose 1983 as my first year of significance. Why did you choose 1983? So that was the year that I got a Sinclair ZX Spectrum um, home computer. I'm not sure if you've encountered such things, but they were very much a gadget to have back in uh, the early 80s. Launched in 1982, I didn't get mine until some months after they first appeared, if I remember correctly. Why is that year significant? What kind of um, made you choose that year? Did it kind of form your initial interest in tech and, and where you're here today in terms of cybersecurity? Well, I suppose my actual initial interest in tech started a few years even earlier than that with handheld electronic games. So I was sort of tossing up between 1983 with the Spectrum or 1979, if I remember rightly, with the Merlin electronic game. But yeah, either of those things were, were like the foundations of me getting into technology. But I suppose the Spectrum was the first proper computer that I had that you could actually program. And so I, I got into it in the same way that many others I'm sure did, typing in listings from magazines, finding they didn't work, trying to work out why they didn't work. And uh, yeah, basically, yeah, that early year, at least in the UK, of, of getting into home computers. Thinking back to 1983, how do you think that the, those years relate to or compare to where we are now in 2024? I suppose, uh, you know, it's far more primitive technology, obviously, but at the same time, it was, you know, it was the, the state of the art at the time. I think, you know, at any point in time when we're looking at technology, there's the things that have become established and the things that are on the horizon. I mean, e even back in the early 80s, we were talking about AI as something of interest, I guess. Well, I wasn't because I was too young to really be appreciating it, but others were. And, you know, now, of course, AI is very topical, far more advanced in terms of what's actually going on with it but yeah we're always looking towards well what's the next thing and what's the capability of the technology going to offer us so i think there, there are parallels in in at least that sense but what you could actually get the technology to do is somewhat more limited than what we can get it to do today do you think that the threat actors also come from a similar background of you know appreciating the tech like you've mentioned the spectrum uh, enjoying video games what sort of profile do these um these threat actors have yeah, so I think, well, certainly historically, when you look back at the, you know, origins of hackers and, and things of that nature, even the term hacker originates from, yeah, the more the tech hobbyists, the enthusiasts, and those people doing creative things with the technology. I think, in actual fact, the term hacker, if you like, got hijacked into meaning the sort of the more negative things in, in actually the same year and 1983 was the year we got the film war games which sort of popularized the view of the hacker i think in the public mind as being you know, sort of the, the teenager behind the computer potentially in that case wreaking potential world war three um but yeah i guess in many cases people you know get enthusiastic about technology trying to understand it and take different pathways within it um, the technology of that era, again, sort of somewhat more limited, but you could, you know, to, to some degree, be getting online. It was via dial-up modems, things of that nature, not into the context of the internet as we now know it, but even that, you know, so the, the, the origin of the term the internet, the internet protocols, again, uh, curiously enough, 1983. So I picked quite a good year there, actually, for the number of things that converge along with my own story. What are your thoughts on ethical hacking? Is that sort of something that you're seeing more prevalent now, or does it come in and out of trend? Well, I, th I think it, de it depends on how you interpret the term. I mean, if, if we're thinking in terms of some sort of sanctioned security testing, penetration testing, etc., against somebody's system that they have contracted somebody to do, let's say, that they've, they've actually invited this, then perfectly reasonable insofar as you're exposing the system to the sort of things that somebody might maliciously be trying to do, applying the same sort of techniques, looking for vulnerabilities and giving you the opportunity to know about them and close them off. 
if we're talking about it in a slightly more grey zone of somebody doing it and then notifying the organisation, not not such a fan of that actually, because that's you know that's still on the wrong side of, of what the organisation that the victim essentially has actually looked for and invited. What have you chosen as your second year? So the second year was either 1992 or 1995. Chronologically, we'll go for 1992. Okay, so 1992 was the year I started a PhD in, well, what was then, it, I, we, it was termed on my, my thesis title, which came around in 1995, which is why it was one or other of those years I picked related to the PhD. Data security in European healthcare information systems was the massively exciting title of my PhD. So 1992 was the year I, I was first exposed to doing something in what we would now call cyber security. How has that evolved since 1992? Uh, in some ways, not so much. And in, in other ways, of course, thanks to the technology and what we're now doing with it quite significantly. So back in 1992, when I was first starting with this, there were lots of things that we didn't have to worry about that we, we now are concerned with. So, for example, the whole notion of online attacks and systems being vulnerable online was not such an issue. I mean, you still did have systems that were connected, but not in the same way, not in the, the same sort of always on, so not affecting us as individual end users to that degree. But some of the core issues, I mean, if we sort of take the textbook thing around security of protecting confidentiality, integrity, availability, that was all very well established already as the, the sort of things we were aiming to safeguard. We had the, you know, the whole notion of sensitive data, data protection, that was already firmly on the agenda. But it was the nature of the systems within which these resided. So you, know, you didn't have, well, even you know, sort of when I was, so I didn't, you had laptops and, and that sort of thing, but they were not commonplace. So your mobile technology was a fairly limited prospect. Most of the stuff was done with, with desktop computers, many of them not in any sense online, out to the on a wide area network, out to the wider world. You had lots of local area networks within organizations. And of course there was some wider connectivity. I'm just from my own perspective, even being at university then, we were not significantly online at that point. Although by 1995, by the end of the period, stuff like the web had arrived. And so uh, you know, there, it was there in that transition period. What did you want to achieve from that PhD? So that, that's a good question. I suppose at, at the start, it it was a little bit unclear to me what I was ultimately aiming for because you know, I my background to this was I was invited to uh, to apply for a project that already existed in the healthcare domain. It was linked to a European uh, framework project at the time, so there was some work that needed to be done in service of the project. But then it was a little bit of sort of finding my own direction within that um, to accompany things and actually. Well, the, the poor people who actually have seen my thesis will realise it's quite a, a thick document and there's a middle chapter that sort of joins between what I was doing for the European project and what I ended up doing that was my own research interest, which don't entirely ask me the path as to how this connects to the healthcare bit, but biometric security using keystroke dynamics. So authenticating people by the way they type on the keyboard. I mean, biometrics and, and that sort of data is very relevant still today. How did you come to that conclusion right back in, well, I hate, to, hate to age it a little bit, but right back in 1992 to 1995. Uh, don't worry, I'm aware of my age. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, biometrics back then were, it was something that you would read about far more readily than you'd ever see anything in practice. And in a lot of the, well, popular press articles and also in academic papers, it was always being presented as the next big thing. You know? So within the next five years, next 10 years, biometrics will be complex. And of course they weren't until mobile phones came along, essentially smartphones in the, I suppose the early 2010s is when we've actually seen biometrics really being something in, in the hands of us as everyday folks. You, you saw from the, even the mid to late 90s and 2000s onwards, you would find particularly fingerprint recognition devices occasionally embedded within other things, but they were the high end stuff. So I suppose the thing that interested me with the, the keystroke now is I just thought it was an interesting idea. I wasn't the first one to do it. I was researching around to try and find a, a direction and came across these papers that were talking about typing rhythms. There, there had also been a researcher within 
our group, and this was at the uh, University of Plymouth, who'd done some very initial um, experimentation himself. And so he had a small bit of code that was knocking around. And uh, OK, that, that's interesting. What might we do with this? And so it, it sort of morphed into doing something. Like, OK, how how well can we authenticate people by the way they type when just doing, if you like, normal word processing type activities. So not typing a known string of text like many of the studies had been doing up to that point. You, you would find things talking about keystroke dynamics applied to usernames and passwords. So profiling people against known text that they were expected to type in. But it was interesting to see, well, okay, if you just developed a general profile of people's typing, could you identify or determine a legitimate user from an imposter? And in the latter case, how quickly could you do it? And so I had uh, various, well, again, poor victims that I required to sort of sit down and do some typing activities and had a real time monitoring thing that could check their profile against or a profile against what they were typing and determine at some point if they were the right user or, or how quickly it would spot an imposter. So again, it was interesting, particularly for that era. I mean, I'm a bit of a fan of kind of, you know, the crime documentaries that you see and you've got forensic science scientists um, looking at handwriting even and that sort of stuff. This sounds like the digital version of that exactly. sort of forensics. Um, yeah. That's fascinating and has many different applications. Yeah, you know, the key thing was a, a way and it's sort of relevant now, of course, in turn, and why we're interested in biometrics now. How can you do the authentication thing for legitimate users actually in a way that is less burdensome for them and equally spot if there is somebody doing or the wrong person doing something within a system. If you were to do your PhD today in 2024, what would you do on? I would be focusing somewhere around issues of usable security in some way. So, I mean, that's why I didn't realize it at the time, but that's ultimately why the keystroke dynamics stuff was interesting for me. It was the, it was how can you do the authentication thing without it having to be in somebody's face? You could do it in parallel with them doing normal activity. And whilst I'm not doing my PhD again myself at the moment, I have got PhD researchers who are doing things that, that to fit along some of those lines. Fantastic. Finally, what's your final year that you've chosen? So I've chosen 2020, uh, which was an interesting year um, from the perspective, of course, of the, the pandemic. And that's not why I've chosen it, but it, I chose it because it's the year that I ultimately moved from the University of Plymouth, where one way or another I'd been since uh, 1988 um, as a undergraduate and then a PhD researcher and then and then and then um, to University of Nottingham which is what's pictured in the background now and uh, moves here to become a professor of cyber security so it's a, the start of well I suppose my first active career decision um, since doing the PhD one, one might argue. Two questions how long has this sort of position of professor in cyber security been around is it quite a new um, almost degree or, or... Um, subject matter. Obviously, it's probably taken different forms in the past, but now we're calling it cybersecurity. So, how long has it been around, and and what do you see as the importance, and perhaps what does Nottingham University see as this importance of of this degree subject? Okay, so I mean, one one thing to contextualise: it's not just in terms of degree subjects. I mean, if we think about it as an academic discipline, and you're right. I mean, it's been around for for quite some time in different forms. So I think if you were to to look back, you know, sort of over the years, back to the early '90s, you'd find places like Royal Holloway. Uh, University of London starting the first MSc in information security here in the UK. And again, um, you know, that's a significant landmark in the UK context. And of course, that in that era called information security, and you still see that term bandied around. In terms of dedicated professors in the topic, um, I'm by no means the, the first and certainly won't be the last as a professor of cyber security or you know, prior topics. I was a professor of information system security when I was at Plymouth. Um, but again, the, I think it, it sort of mirrors the, the recognition of the topic area. There, there's certainly been yeah, academic attention towards security with whatever sort of prefix you give it uh, for quite some time, but it's become ever more topical. I think the sort of transition to it being termed cyber security, and you can 
uh, I should add, you can draw specific distinctions between what information security is and what cyber security is and whether one is a subset or superset of the other. But I think in the broad sort of popular understanding, you know, the, the term information security has been replaced by cyber security and it's gained more recognition as a result. We see here in the UK lots of, if talking about academic programmes, lots of both masters and undergraduate degrees specifically in cyber security. And again, if you turn the clock back to when I was doing the PhD, you didn't have any of that specifically there, other than perhaps I say the Holloway MSc existed around the same time as I was doing the, the PhD research, but other things um, uh, perhaps not. But there's been a significant growth in that over the years. We've now got National Cyber Security Centre doing degree certification. So we've got you know, sort of recognised routes and, and levels, standards for the degrees to, to, to aim towards. And so, you know, that those in itself it is is reflecting the increased need for cyber security within an organization. I mean, it's, it's been needed for, for some time, you know, irrespective of this, but that, that recognition of the skill shortage, the, the need for a pipeline of cyber security talent, uh, for want of a better term, coming through because there are more, basically there are more vacancies and there are skilled people to, to do them at the moment. Are you, are you seeing, with this interest in cyber security, are you seeing that uptake in, in students, is it, is it um, correlating with more people showing interest in the subject matter? And then do you think that this is, is you know, a good um, potentially long term impact for the, the, uh, the skill shortage that we are facing in the industry? Yeah, I think in answer to the overall question, yes, there, there's a significant upturn in, in students taking it because it's another route for those students who might previously have taken a more general computer science or computing program. So that if they've already determined that they're interested in this, they can they can focus in that from the outset of their studies. At Nottingham, just to go back to your, your point also about sort of the, the university's interest there. So Nottingham doesn't have a dedicated MSc or BSc in cybersecurity, but we do have cybersecurity and related topics embedded within the wider computer science curriculum. And there it proves to be a popular thing amongst the students. And we've got you know, a lot of students wanting to do final year projects, MSc projects in that area. And on the research side, which I think is the primary motivator, let's say, for, for my role having been created and the, the wider investment that the university's done, it's, again, recognising the, the significance and the, the need for the topic. But also Nottingham itself had various projects, um, externally funded projects, PhDs, etc., in the cyber security and data privacy related areas, but didn't have a, a dedicated group that was focused in that area. So that, that's, if you like, been part of my remit since joining. But overall, yeah, I think it's it's a picture of growth for cyber security as a both an academic area of study and research, and all of it is contributing towards trying to address the, the ongoing challenges that the advancement of the technology and our dependence on it has introduced. So why do you think that the, the skill shortage exists? I think to, to some degree, it's perhaps a lack of earlier recognition of the significance of the, the breadth, if you like, of the cybersecurity requirements within organisations. As our investment and our use of the technology has increased, there are more things about it that need to be protected and secured, and we need an increased range of expertise and skills to enable us to do it. I think Again, in years past, perhaps that would be bundled into the general requirements, expectations of a role of the IT people. But you know, similarly with, with IT more generally, there are, as the, the domain expands, there are more areas of specialization. You need particular people to be doing it. Um, you, know, you think about what the investment and the use of IT looks like in modern organizations compared to 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, whatever, it's continually more dependence on the technology, more things held in that space. And so, yeah, naturally, we've got more that we need to we need to invest in protecting um, you know, the, the dimensions of, of the risk um, require different skill sets to address them. 
And finally, on this year, what would you say to um, a potential student, someone perhaps even in um, in secondary school right now? What would you say to them to get them interested or excited in, you know, taking a module on cybersecurity, for example, or you know, being one of your students? So I think that the key thing is is the breadth of what cybersecurity actually includes. I mean, there's the technical challenge and the problems that you can solve there. I mean, if you're interested in finding the vulnerabilities within systems and, and protecting the systems against them, that's one dimension. But you know, taking it, if you like, to the other end of the, the spectrum, um, you know, it, there's the human aspect and the business aspect to this as well. And unless you take a an overall holistic view of you know, addressing the technology you need and the wider human business organizational needs, you're going to still retain some area of vulnerability. And it generally takes people with different interests and skill sets to fill the different gaps. And so there is quite genuinely something for many different takes. I wouldn't say something for everybody, but something for you know, a variety of different interests that can then contribute towards this topic. It's not all about being a, a deeply technical um, IT person to, to contribute effectively in cybersecurity. So if, if, a, if a person who is considering their subject matter um, in the next few years, they might want to think, you know, to go to something that is broad reaching so then they can, you know, maybe tie down what they're actually interested in perhaps. I'd certainly encourage anyone interested in to, to do a search for cybersecurity career pathways or something like that. They will likely come across things from, and I'll give a couple of examples, the UK Cyber Security Council and the Chartered Institute for Information Security, both of which I've got some level of involvement in supporting, um, both have things about career paths and the different routes into the discipline. And the yeah, I think it's it's incredibly important to, to do that research and to, to maybe just see if there's anything relevant for them. Um, and so it kind of brings me on to my final question, which is the fact that you are going to be at cyber, uh, Cloud and uh, Cybersecurity Expo in March. So um, my final question to you is, what are you looking forward to at the event and sharing with, with many professionals? What's, what's something that you're looking forward to? Well, largely being well, not only participating myself in terms of the, the activity, the panel that I'm involved in, but also just hearing what others have got to say, getting, you know, sort of increasing the, the extent to which I become up to date in what's going on in the discipline, because you know, I, I'm not up to date sufficiently in all of the areas so that there will be bound to be things that I learn from it, the chance to network with folks and generally see what's going on.